Oh, I guess everybody is already in here, right on time too, like 6.30. That's kind of how I've been trying to pace all the stuff. So, uh, hello, welcome, I'm Ferris. Um, good to see you, Jesse. Uh, Jess or Jesse? Jess. Yes. I did the IE part because COVID brain. I'm gonna go with COVID brain. Uh, Jess, good to see you. Uh, Jess was asking when was the last time we had an in-person meetup uh, last month here, and then the month before at the library, but kind of a mess to use them, but we'll probably be using them in April when Python's here again, PyCon is here again. Uh, so for those who don't know, this is the PHP meetup group. Uh, actually, it's not, it's Python. And if you are a PHP person, please stick around because we're gonna make your life so much better. Uh, and yeah, I've used that joke like five times and people are still laughing, I like it. Uh, welcome, I'm Ferris. Uh, this current iteration of Salt Lake City Python was created in 2013 in the back of Sugar House Coffee when I saw some people messing around with the Django admin interface and said, hey, I have a random area that, or like location that we can use to host a meetup, let's host a meetup. And we started doing a web dev meetup. And then at the end of that meetup, we decided just to do a Python meetup, like not a Python web dev meetup, just all of Python. Um, and then it became a Python data meetup somehow. I'm just kidding, but it's kind of funny. A lot of our talks have been about Python data. So I'm happy that Drew's gonna be giving a talk tonight that's kind of more back to our roots about uh, Python web and Django and all that fun stuff. Um, but yeah, throughout the years, we've been kind of nomadic. This has been our home and then COVID and then we're back. So I'm very happy that we are back in the INSCC. As such, I would ask a couple housekeeping things. There's a big old sign that says, don't bring food or drink in here, which is like, yeah, don't do it. And I'm on the recording, so don't do it. But if you do, make sure to clean up vigorously after yourself, please. So uh, just a, a one point order. The other is please make sure you have a name tag that has a number on it. Uh, and the reason is at the end of this, we're gonna do a raffle for some cool prizes. You probably saw one over there and I need to bring the box over. Uh, but we're gonna be raffling off some MicroPython little things and probably quite a few of them. Uh, so make sure that your name tag has a number and if it doesn't, before the raffle, come up here and we'll get all of that set up. Uh, no worries. Uh, cool. Agenda. So what we like to do is we have kind of some intros. So I just did my whole spiel of our meetup group. Salt Lake City Python, which is part of Utah Python, which helps uh, Python Utah North. And if the Pi ladies are interested, you know, we're totally down to like help sponsor a thing or two. Um, there's other Python meetup groups around the valley. I don't know, Pi ladies haven't been meeting up since COVID, but hopefully we have enough folks here that one of them was like, oh, I want to help out with that. Could that be you? Are you in the audience now? Anyway, but let me know if you do want to help out with that group. Um, also, Python Utah North is in Logan. I think they're going to have their first in-person meetup in November. Um, and those are kind of the ones around the town. Uh, and we'll dive into community news after intro. So what we also do is like, what's occupying, if you're new, what's occupying your time? And then we'll do something fun, like favorite Halloween costume. So one you've seen or worn or a prank, because I want to throw in a prank this year. Uh, so I'm Ferris. Uh, for some reason, I'm an engineering manager at a genetic testing company. Uh, and my favorite Halloween costume has to be one of those like buddy costumes whenever you like either you pair off with somebody and it's like Mario and Luigi or like you're like the back half of a horse or like you're the back half of a horse but like you pretend your front never showed up so anyway but those kind of I don't know I like those who else is new anybody this gentleman well I'm new uh, my name is Jonas it's my first time um uh, I just moved here like a few months ago, so super excited to find Python mm -hmm. meetups. I've been using Python like at work and in side projects for like I guess ten years now. I used to work in genetic testing too. Uh, used to do laboratory automation uh, primarily. Now I do developer tools. Um, Halloween, I try to avoid participating in that, but um, I, I since I just mentioned I've been in genetic testing. 
my cop-out, shitty, terrible costumes to take a bottle of water and say that I'm a liquid handler. Nice. Don't even bother with the lab coat. Yeah, I know. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone's just going to think you're thirsty. Yeah, just for context, anyone not from the industry, liquid handler is the name of a machine that you find in pretty much every biotech lab. Mm. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Or the lackey that gets assigned to pipette something from one thing to another. Uh, sometimes. Well, which, which, uh, where'd you move from? Um, if you're I, sure. So I was in the Bay Area, so I'm one of those Californians who overcrowd Salt Lake City. Yeah. Um, originally, I'm from Germany. Oh, okay. We used to call y'all uh, California refugees, but I was told that maybe that term is uh, overloaded now. But anyway, welcome to Utah. <laughs> uh, nice, to, nice to have you. Uh, what part of Germany? Deutsch. You're like the fifth person to say that today. Um, oh, nice. So yeah, there's, I, there was a, I'll give you some background as to why, because Utah actually had a German program uh, historically, so that might be part of the reason, but keep going. Um, so I was born in East Germany when that was still a thing, um, but I mostly grew up in the south, so there's a big lake, Nietzsche? Lake Constance, at the border to Switzerland and Austria. Oh, like Bayern and that? Everyone knows Bayern, it's like the Texas of Germany. Uh, I'm from the other state in South Germany, which is called Baden-Württemberg. Is that like the Oklahoma of Germany? Sorry, I'm overextending the metaphor now. <laughs> um, no, Just say yes. No, <laughs> sorry. In, in every single way, welcome to the group, welcome to Utah, welcome to all of it. So, anybody? Oh, and, and did you? And yeah, you said your awesome liquid handling tunneling costume. So, oh, who else is new? I'm going to claim I'm new. I'm not really new. I came many, many, many years ago, but I'm. I'm, I'm Coming back. This is you from the ashes of COVID. Exactly, yeah. COVID kind of put in everything. Mm -hmm. So um, I'm Nate. Uh, writing Python occupies almost all of my time. Um, need to find some other hobbies, of course. Uh, favorite Halloween costume? I've only been in town for one Halloween in the last decade. So I, I have very little Halloween experience. Very, very little. Well, I was always a pumpkin as a kid, and that was great. I love making pumpkins. <laughs> but it's been a long time since I saw it. Long time since I saw it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. 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 Oh, well, what part of the valley do you reside in right now? Uh, South Jordan. Oh, okay. Well, that's like Halloween Central. You just got to. Oh, you have, absolutely. Yeah, just get a car and go to a I, church parking lot, and you can get all the candy you want. And I'll be in town this year, so. Go to the neighboring and just get all the candies. We. Uh, well, last year we had people <laughs> driving into our neighborhood to like go trick or treating. It's like, yes, I made it in life. I'm like in the no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> uh, awesome. Uh, did you did you mention what you do for? Product? Oh, I'm an engineer for four hundred one go. So I build I build four hundred one k software. Oh, cool. Nice. Sweet. Uh, and you. That's, that must be hard. Like right now, everybody's been telling me not to look at my 401k, and so. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. every day is a little bit stressful. But <laughs> they're right, don't look at your 401k. Give it a few months. It's better today than it was yesterday, though. That's true. That's, That's true. true. I heard. <laughs> yeah. uh, excellent. Anybody else who's new? I'll jump on that bandwagon. It's been a while for me. Yes, uh, please. David, David I have one. Uh, I'm, I'm the word of the group. I'm a sysadmin. Uh, let's see occupying my time. Um, I actually work here for the U, and uh, we're working on a project to uh, take on Department of Defense grants, so that has been occupying a lot of my time. Uh, favorite Halloween costume? Not one I've ever worn, but um, I was always jealous of uh, Sheldon's uh, Doppler effect. That was pretty cool. <laughs> That's a great one. I, I missed the reference. I what? The, uh, From Big Bang Theory, Theory the, the TV show. Shelton's what? Doppler, Doppler effect. effect. He dressed up like the Doppler effect? Yes. Yeah. His vertical lines and... and you need to Google it. Yeah. I will Google it. And then watch the video. <laughs> I'll, I'll ask my partner. She's very much a, a fan of uh, that show. Anyway, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I'm uh, it's that, Okay, great. Are you going to dress up like Doppler effect again this year? If I could, you know, I've never found the clothing, but if I can, you know. I'd be all over that. Thanks. Stripes are slimming. Uh, actually, and well, I don't know if I have a, a flora pie. I'll bring it next time. Maybe I should have for costume season, but whatever. We have a, a 
Python microcontrollers that you can attach electric string to. And like, anyway, I'll send people links if they're interested and want to buy it themselves, or I'll get it as a raffle prize. But yeah, you could dress up in Python. Sorry, I nerded out too long. Uh, who else is new? My name's Trevor. Um, Hello, Trevor. Hey. Uh, I've got four kids, so that's pretty much all my time. Then uh, I work. I also work for Four One Go, so Four One K stuff. Then I can't come up with anything witty about Halloween costumes, but you know, I like to see people's. I I don't have one personally, but if somebody's got like high fantasy stuff, that's really cool. That's, that's awesome. I have a question. Do Do you all have like a volleyball league against the Five Twenty Nine people? Or is it just like, <laughs> like does each like code of the tax, federal tax, like have its own company or anyway? Uh, largely, yes. <laughs> it's kind of funny. Uh, yeah. You should dress up like a 529 for Halloween. Just like if each of your kids accounts, just like, please <laughs> give me a raise. This is my work Halloween costume. I'm just kidding. <laughs> well, good to have you at the meetup. Uh, cool. Who else? Anybody? Awesome, sweet. The sooner I stop talking, the better it seems. So I'm gonna keep going with this. Uh, community news, Python is on three point, what, are we on one one yet? Or no? Okay, we're still on 10. I'll increment that at some point. Okay, any, any tech ecosystem news, big changes, stuff we should know about? I guess Twitter's gonna get body in. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, did anybody code on the OG Twitter API before they made it crap? Oh my gosh, that was the best. <laughs> oh. Pokemon API is now my go-to for lessons like that. Twitter. Anyway, um, any real tech news? <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> just kidding. <laughs> oh. Awesome. Okay, jobs. Anybody who knows of places hiring remote or in the valley, speak up. It's the wrong time of my life for that, too. Okay. Uh, my company, Block, formerly known as Square, is still hiring. Uh, we've got, uh, I work in the machine learning department. We've got um, ML, machine learning modeler, machine learning engineer, and data science positions still available. Um, and probably among other things, what's really good. Wait, like this square? Or which square? Is that the like square the app? thing? The yeah. 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 This square. yeah, so it was yeah. confusing. It was like Facebook meta thing where like they have a product called Square, but then the parent company was called Square, but there were other products and that was confusing. Right. So Square is still Square, but the parent company so it's like, is like meta. It's like alphabet. It's like alphabet, alphabet and meta. Later. Yeah. yeah. Cool. So <laughs> Yeah, it's 100% remote. Yeah. Block's been doing that. Has changed their name while back, though, right? It's been the name change? Yeah. Oh, uh, like maybe six <laughs> months? Years, really? No, I no, it's been in the last year. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. I missed the opportunity to go by hip. That could be square. Yeah, I didn't it was like the next dimension kind of thing. Why are you in IT? You should be in marketing. <laughs> <laughs> well, he is the sys admin in the group. Yeah. Uh, excellent. Uh, anybody else? Oh, and I'll have them talk to you, Jess, isn't it? Okay. Okay. Jess. I don't work in talent she acquisition. She is cool. Yeah, I can yeah, get no bonus, baby. Gets. I get no bonuses. Oh, lame. Fat bonus of zero dollars. <laughs> okay, got it. <laughs> uh, did I capture that correctly? I think so. Okay, good. Uh, anybody else who's hiring? Um, this is sort of second-hand knowledge, but I work at AWS. We have a Slack channel that's Utah Amazonians, and someone recently came there and said, I got permission to start a new team in Utah. Uh, it's the data sync team, Yeah. So data synchronization. Um, but uh, we also have a lot of fully remote people like myself. and. Uh, if you're into that kind of thing, just type virtual Utah into the location box, even though it's very real, and uh, you'll find them all. No hiring freeze last time I checked. 
Excellent. Anybody else? Secondhand knowledge is totally welcome, by the way. That's kind of why we're, and we gather all these minds into this room. I imagine Twitter's hiring because people keep leaving. <laughs> <laughs> That's third hand knowledge, yes. We're going to leave it at second hand. <laughs> Uh, I mean, otherwise I'd point people to Meta, but... Uh, okay, well, that's totally fine. Who's looking? Now's your chance. You can market yourself and be like, yeah, I typed in three buttons and now my company makes billions of dollars. And we'll call you out for being a liar, but still, no, nobody's looking. Okay, sounds good. Well, that leaves me to Mr. Drew over here. Uh, I will say a couple things before we dive too deep is uh, uh, who likes typing in passwords? Who really enjoys it? I, gotta, I have to make sure I'm capturing everybody here raising their hands and enjoying it, which is absolutely nobody. So yeah, uh, and whose password just sucks? Because when they do, you. I don't mind those. Mine's just awful. I know it's, it's pretty like probably cryptographically secure, but I, I just hate my password. So that's why. Oh, it's uh, <laughs> <laughs> nice, nice, uh, excellent. Uh, but yeah, without further ado, I'll invite Drew. He's going to be telling us all about how to eliminate the password, and uh, perhaps at our February soiree, we'll like make a password effigy and just destroy it. <laughs> Or a Python 2 effigy and just destroy that. Yeah, without further ado. Sweet. Go ahead. Can I use your, uh, your dongle there yeah, to connect? That's what I was planning on doing. Awesome. And I think it's the used dongle for the record. Oh, okay. Okay. Let's start this up. <clears throat> okay. Um, well, let me just skip ahead here. So, I'm kind of a nobody, so <laughs> I'll just tell you a little of my background so you don't feel like this is just completely some rando talking to you. So yeah, trigger warning, um, <laughs> sorry about that. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, so anyway, so, so I studied computer science at BYU. And I didn't really know what I was doing when I was there studying it because I, I'm, I was the kind of person who was sort of indignant about crappy software all growing up um, and thought I hated computers. Um, but when I started programming and realized there was something I could do about bad software, then I was like, okay, maybe this is, this is a worthwhile pursuit. And anyway, I ended up studying computer science. Um, while I was there, I did a lot of research in a lab called the Social Technology and Privacy Lab. Um, so it's a lot of human-computer interaction research, studying people's experiences us using mostly social media. So it was funny when you mentioned Ferris, the Twitter API, because I was on a project. Facebook is, or Meta, I guess, is trying to reopen kind of their original API to the research community. And I was on a project beta testing that, and that was interesting. Um, although, didn't really inspire that much confidence uh, in that corporation. <laughs> but um, anyway, so I got really interested in, in human-computer interaction there. Also started looking for jobs as I was moving out of school and got horribly frustrated by it. and so said, why don't I do something about it? So I started this company, Filtra. Um, now we're pretty small still. Um, anybody here use Filtra by chance? I wouldn't expect. Okay. Um, so basically, Filtra, we're calling it an automated career counselor because we want to automate most of the, you know, job getting process, the recruitment process um, for developers, data scientists, data engineers, and the like. Um, but right now we're really focused on just getting you curated uh, leads for jobs. So I'll uh, 
because I have to pad out this presentation a little bit, I'll show you what, what it looks like. Um, really simple. So um, you just have this profile here and then uh, I didn't put in my, my profile picture, but you, you can. Um, and then the big thing is um, this right here is what we call your filtra. And so what we're trying to do is ask you about your preferences in terms of career opportunities and um, condense those into a standardized data set so that we can then basically process all the incoming opportunities that we get um, and send you the ones that might actually be relevant to you. So the idea here is hopefully that if you were ever to change jobs, you could do it passively based on having received you know, an opportunity that, that met your criteria. So I'll just show you really quick. Uh, we look at skills, um, the compensation you'd be looking for, uh, whether or not you want equity compensation, the benefits you need, um, the work type, workplace, location. And this is, this is subject to change. I actually, I mean, I know that we have a couple things slotted to change in there in terms of the criteria that we'll be collecting going forward. But um, basically the idea is you fill that out and you'll receive job opportunities that match your criteria. And they'll always be in this standardized format, so you can just take a quick look and really fast decide whether or not it's something to follow up on. Which I know can be a big value add for those of us who get tons of recruiter spam on LinkedIn. <laughs> um, so anyway, not to talk too much more about that, I will so Shadrach back there in the corner is my co-founder. Um, we didn't 100% talk about this, but I'm just gonna take a risk here. Um, do you think we could like prioritize all these people if if they were to sign up? Yeah, like, absolutely. Uh, right now I'm kind of leaving out on the lead assignment and everything, so like, if any of you want to sign up today, then we can prioritize you guys and come through everybody as a cool group. So. Yeah, so, um, if you guys, let's say, uh, created your credentials, just at least your, your email and password, before the end of the day, we could push you uh, several leads within the next week, just so you could get a sense of how this works. Um, so it's filtra.io. Um, anyway, so there's that. Um, now, uh, I also <coughs> consult with this company uh, called Omnibond that uh, has kind of a disparate set of pro products. Um, but what I do with them is uh, I am working on enabling uh, WebAuthn, which we'll talk about today, for uh, kind of the academic and research community. So um, I guess. I won't belabor that point anymore, and we'll just get into the meat of it. So um, I had this funny realization that our relationship with passwords is kind of a kind of a toxic relationship, <laughs> a la toxic dating relationship. Um, so I'll run you through uh, uh, what my my idea of why it's like that in just a minute. Um, but before we do, I want to get a sense of the audience because even just from people introducing themselves, it feels like this is a, a more advanced audience than was here last time, and so some of my slides might be talking down a bit. But uh, I think we can calibrate if I ask enough questions of you. So do, how many people here have heard of WebAuthn? Okay, so most. Um, and then... So I would assume if you've heard of it, you understand asymmetric cryptography, kind of the underlying pieces. Not so much. Can we get a show of hands? And, you know, I didn't understand this until fairly recently. Who, who feels like they could under, like explain asymmetric cryptography? Okay. Okay, cool. So we, we, ha we have some ground to cover. I'm not completely useless here. <laughs> um, all right, thanks for, for, for being willing learners. 
Okay, so passwords, we don't deserve them. So I don't think passwords were a terrible idea on the face of it, right? Um, it's just when we got involved that things went wrong. Uh, so we started doing stuff like this pretty much as soon as uh, we were given passwords. And that's just the beginning of the toxic relationship. So then it became this adversarial sort of game, us versus the security people. Um, they started coming up with these literal games to get us to produce uh, reasonable passwords. Um, and now it's just us fighting them to let us log into things. And, um, and then, you know, even though they've given us this, we still do the bare minimum, don't we? So we really don't give a lot to this relationship. And then we're forgetful. We, we're really a horrible partner with passwords. And so we do these silly things to try to remember them. Um, it was funny creating this file so that I could take that screenshot. Um, just because it reminded me that at one of my previous jobs, we actually had this file. It was just an obscure name on an obscure server. <laughs> um, anyway, it's crazy. Um, but nonetheless, it was, it was true. I'm surprised you don't have the workings thing up there with pencil. Do you know that reference? Mm-mm. Oh, man, you got to watch that movie. Because he hacks into a computer at school, and underneath, underneath the uh, keyboard is the passwords that they scratched out for the last five years. <laughs> the pencil is the, is the one that they have. Yeah, that. So he goes in the factory's house, and he has a, he got a computer set of a car for Christmas, and he gets on the phone with the modem, and he hacks into the school and changes his grades. And then he changes his girlfriend's grades later. <laughs> it's like Ferris Bueller hacks the DOD. It's it is great. It is Ferris Bueller. <laughs> Who did that later, like the same year? That's pretty funny. Um, yeah, so, I mean, anybody <laughs> else? In my metaphor, maybe that was Ferris Bueller. No, no. no. Okay. In both movies, we have. So. Yeah, I know, and I was trying to remember now. You threw me off. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and, and can anybody top that or, or any of these? Any crazier password memorization schemes you've seen in your life? I remember, or it, I don't know, maybe it's past the... Yeah, I think it's past seven years. So anyway, back uh, back when I was in high school in 04, uh, for the middle school, the entire server, like, I think it was, what, 240 gigabytes, and that was a big deal at the time. Uh, but yeah, the passwords were right in the server cage. And uh, four months later, somehow, somebody had started, like, storing a lot of just pirated stuff on it. And they're like, well, I wonder how this happened, so... <laughs> That's pretty funny. Yeah, I uh, some some of my family members are on <laughs> on this level right now, and it really makes me nervous. Um, but no matter the amount of evangelizing I do, it doesn't help. Um, okay, yeah. So then, uh, you know, we felt that the relationship with passwords wasn't working out super well, so we started cheating on them. Was our solution right? Um, so. We had to get these, these other second factors for authentication involved. Um, Duo, obviously, as a student, was something I was very much exposed to, and I'm sure many of you are as well. Um, and then, uh, of course, when it comes down to it, we just straight up betray our passwords. So. You know, 90% of grandparents will attempt to recover an Amazon account they do not have. And that's probably not a true statistic, but it's probably close to that. I made that up for a fact. Yes, please go. <laughs> Seriously, I've had this argument with my coworkers, and it's like, you turn around and you recognize you're the grandparents. So give you a few years, you'll be there. <laughs> yeah. So, um, anyway, just from my lived experience, but not that all grandparents would be like that. Um, okay, so, um, crypto is king. So, just wanted to introduce a little bit about 
uh, the cryptography that underlies this. So symmetric cryptography is kind of the, the basic, what you would think of when you think about cryptography. Um, so let's do a show, show of hands again. Symmetric cryptography, if that makes sense to you. Okay. So um, really very simple, um, not super simple to implement the advanced encryption standard, I believe the algorithm is called. <laughs> But uh, the high level concept is simple. Um, so basically the idea with symmetric cryptography is that you have uh, some message that you want to be able to pass in a, you know, over, over a, a public channel in a secretive way. And so what you would do um, is you, you're gonna have a secret key. Now, obviously I just have a picture of the key, but it's gonna be, you know, some a bit string. Um, and you're going to use a, a predetermined algorithm. Um, most of the time today it is AES, the Advanced Encryption Standard. And you're gonna combine the key and your message using that algorithm, essentially to scramble your message and output something indiscernible. Um, and then on the other side, you'll have the key and the algorithm and this indiscernible string. You'll put the key and the indiscernible string back into the algorithm and you'll come out with your message that you wanted to send. Um, I'm realizing now I'm probably not a great teacher because I don't know how to draw out of the crowd, like whether or not people are totally understanding. Um, did, did that make sense to people? Okay. Um, yeah, nods are good, I guess. <laughs> uh, so anyway, so this is symmetric cryptography. And we're just going to take one step further um, to get you where you need to be to understand WebAuthn. So asymmetric cryptography is kind of like the next level of cryptography. Um, and it's, it's just kind of one step beyond what, we're, what we already talked about. So with asymmetric cryptography, what we're doing is generating, instead of one key that's shared between the originating party of the message and the receiving party, we're actually creating a pair of keys that are cryptographically linked. If that makes sense. Um, so I have this gold one and the silver one, and those those keys are cryptographically linked. And in this scenario, I'm going to keep the gold key and give the silver key to the other person that I want to be able to understand my messages. Um, and we can do the same thing that we did with symmetric cryptography. We can take this, you know plain text message, turn it into something indiscernible with the gold key that I have. And then now, my, the person receiving the message from me with the silver key can turn this message back, this indiscernible string back into my message. Yeah? So, because well often, so the, the public key cryptography I'm used to is you have a public key and a private key. Do they have a similar concept with web often? Yeah, exactly. Thanks for bringing that up. So, um, what's typical with asymmetric cryptography is this concept of a public and private key, right? And so, um, in a lot of cases, in a lot of the applications of asymmetric cryptography, one of these keys, we'll call it the gold key, is considered the private key, and one is considered the public key. And the private key, it, yeah, go ahead. In your example, it would be switched. Yeah. Because of the... Because the person who's getting it doesn't want to give away the key. You can encrypt it with the public key. It can decrypt it with the private key. That's right. Yeah. So... I just wanted to clarify that because if you don't say that, then it gets it can be confusing. Yeah. Okay. Because the other way around is that's what a digital signature would be. Is you encrypt it with the 
private key and everybody can decrypt it, but the public key verify it's you. Right. Sorry about that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, okay, okay. Yeah, so you're just saying basically. That's the private key. Yeah, that's the private key. Yeah. Yep, 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 yep. Oh, okay, yeah. That's all I was getting at, sorry. Yeah, no. Um, yeah, let me see if I can even make that more concrete for myself sure. and for others, maybe. <laughs> so. Sorry about that. No, no. It, it's kind of an important fact, though. Yeah, stay with me here and, and correct me if, I'm, if I get lost again. So, um, in the case of, a, of having these defined public and private keys, right, typically, the, um, I guess it's important, very important, that we talk a little bit about identity, um, right? So the, the reason asymmetric cryptography is really interesting is because of its ability to establish identity, um, right? Which is why we start to meet up with the password idea. Um, so let's think about it in terms of an application. So like, on a blockchain, for example, this is a huge part of blockchains. Um, you are going to have, sorry, were we saying silver is private? Yes. Okay. So basically, on a blockchain, when you are paid some cryptocurrency, if this is a cryptocurrency blockchain, the the money is sent to your essentially public key, right? It's tied to that. And that public key is on the blockchain, so anyone can see that there is this public key and it's associated with a certain amount of money. And the way that we associate that with a, a person is through the private key. Um, we're saying silver's private. And so, for example, if someone wanted to prove wanted to prove that I was the person who controlled that public key and thus that money on the blockchain, they would take um, my public key and encrypt a message, which could be just like this one here, and send that encrypted string to me. To me. And since I'm saying that I'm the only one who, who has that private key that's private to me, I am the only one who can decrypt that message and send it back to them and say, hey, I just proved to you I, I have this key, so I, con I control that key pair. Does that make sense? <laughs> Did we get there? Yeah? Okay. Um, thanks for pulling that out. That, that's, that was super helpful. Um, okay. So with that basic understanding, there's not too much further down we need to go to understand WebAuthn. Um, so, without further ado, here's my probably inadequate diagram of what WebAuthn looks like. Um, so, <laughs> uh, now we're we're gonna be very turned around. It's still, it's still cool. You've got it um, Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so anyway. I'm gonna mess with you here and say that gold's private now, silver public. Um, but it, it, it's a fairly simple idea. The idea being, we're gonna use asymmetric cryptography to prove our identity. So when I register myself, when I create an account using WebAuthn, what happens is I use the cryptographic hardware on my device to generate an asymmetric key pair, a public-private key pair. And my device is going to store for me the private key, and I'm going to give whatever service I'm logging into, I put Facebook here, the public key. And so now, um, instead of using a password, when I want to log in, Facebook can challenge me for my private key like we just talked about. So they're going to take a string, a message, and encrypt it with my public key. And since I told them I'm keeping this key private, they're going to send that 
now jumbled string over to me where I'm going to decrypt it with my private key and send it back and show them that I, in fact, do have the private key associated with that public key. Um, now you can see because they've associated this public key with me, or John Doe in this case, in the database, um, they can then have confidence that I am who I say I am. Um, does this much make sense? Yeah? Okay. I have a Yeah. Yeah, so what's interesting, I'm wondering how deep to go into this, but um, so WebAuthn, actually that allows me to explain an important point. So WebAuthn is a browser, a web standard, right? Um, so something that's being implemented in the different browsers um, to enable this. But what it does fundamentally is it it talks or it it really is an interface through the browser for you to talk to lower level hardware on the machine um, so when for example I'm logging in with WebAuthn and Facebook gives me that challenge and sends it to me um, the challenge is going to be received in the in the browser but when I call into the WebAuthn API in the browser, the challenge gets passed down into the hardware and handled at that level and then passed back up. So that's one of the compelling things about this is the keys are being managed um, within secure hardware. Um, and there's actually a larger sort of protocol called FIDO2 um, that enables all of this. Yeah, it's just, I mean, actually it'd be pretty interesting to dig into, but probably beyond the scope of, of what we're talking about here. Um, anyway, any questions up to this point? Okay. So, with that solved, or that done, now we're kind of rolling down the hill in terms of solving these problems that we talked about before. So, we're not memorizing anything anymore, right? And then now there's no more like adversarial game of security people trying to get the rest of the world to create good passwords. Um, just each key that's generated is cryptographically secure because it was generated you know, automatically by the machine um, in a way that was programmed and certified to be secure already. And then we don't have anything to manage because all the keys are staying on the machine, being managed by the machine. We don't have this stuff to memorize and keep track of. I have another question. So, yeah. so what does somebody do when they use this to sign in something and you know, their hard drive goes conflict? You know, is there, is there a, a backup mechanism like with uh, trying to think of the other standard? And I think it also goes to how you enroll. Yeah. Yeah, and I think that he's probably going to answer that question. Okay. That's why I'm waiting. <laughs> I keep joking. <laughs> I know you're good. I just trying to decide if I want to ask or not. Yeah. <laughs> you can tell me to wait. That's cool. Uh, I don't have a slide for that, so let's just address it now. Um, so, the way this is playing out with companies who are adopting it, um, and actually it's interesting. So, at Filtro, we don't use it yet. And that's because, like, as a startup, we wanted to use, you know, third-party identity management, and they want to charge us an arm and a leg to, to make this happen for us. Yeah. Um, but the way that they would do it, if if we were going to do it with them, is it's just gradual, right? So everybody maintains their passwords. Um, we turn on two-factor auth, and then we allow them to create WebAuthn. Uh, keys on top of those existing methods. Um, now, the, the other thing is, and this, this is kind of where the big platform players come into play, Apple, Microsoft, Google, basically. Um, they're working on this thing called pass keys, which 
they're trying to basically en enable a way to pass around these keys between devices and, and things. Um, but you also have the option to, you know, most of my things that I log into, I log into on my computer and on my phone, maybe even somewhere else, a tablet, something like that. And so you should have, in an ideal world, a key on each device, right? So if you fail in one area, you can recover, recover it with the other device. Not perfect, I mean, something could happen to everything, right? Um, so that's potentially a reason for keeping a password with a second factor of authentication. Um, but yeah, that's kind of one of the, one of the tricky spots with this. Thank you. Yeah. Did, did that completely address that? It doesn't answer the enrollment question. Yeah, it does. So clarify for me what, what you're so, asking about. So I signed up for one of these companies. Yeah. You commented a second ago about how you start with passwords and then you move to two-factor, but what if you didn't have that to start with? What would you, how would you enroll? Is it something that's like a browser extension that just it encrypts on my machine and then stores it locally on the, in the browser cache or something like that, or what? Okay, I think. Do you understand what I'm saying? I think so. Like, if if you didn't have a password with them and you want to just use WebAuthn. Sure, or whatever. I mean, I don't really care how we got to the point of WebAuthn necessarily. Those two other steps are trivial, right? They don't make make, make any difference. I haven't encountered any. But I still have to have a token locally on my box. How did I get that? How did you get the token? How did it get there? Yeah. yeah. Okay. So, so WebAuthn has a registration and an authentication component. That's what I was getting at. Okay. Cool. Yeah. And maybe let's dig into that when we see some code. Yeah, yeah that's fine. We don't have to do it now. Yeah. That's something that we can answer later. If that's totally fine. Yeah. But I'm glad I understand what you mean now. Okay. Um, okay. So then, um, if we're not remembering anything, we don't have anything to give away. Right, unless someone wants to somehow try to dig into the hardware and get it out. Um, and then, so, uh, so anyway, kind of some demos to illustrate some of this and hopefully make it a little more concrete. So first, I'm just gonna show you uh, what this looks like. Has anyone used WebAuthn with anything yet? No? Yeah, and that's... At least not really. Yeah. I think I would know, probably. I think you would know. Um, and you'll, you'll see here. Um, yeah, it's frustrating because I think it's actually a very good thing and I wish it was rolling out faster. I think it is going to get moving faster once the big platforms um, roll out their support, which is supposed to be happening basically as we speak. Um, Where is it currently supported? So you need, yeah. So which browsers have it? Uh, Chrome is what I develop on. It for sure supports it um, on Mac OS, um, on Windows. Um, I don't know where support levels are with Linux, but I I tend to think they're there. WebAuthn itself has actually um, been around for a little bit now, several years, and it's, it's pretty well supported. Um, but it comes back to this FIDO2 piece. So there's a client to authenticator protocol, um, which basically means the protocol that allows the browser to talk to the, the hardware. And that has to be implemented by all these providers, right? <clears throat> so that's kind of the domino that's falling um, or fallen more recently but for the most part it's there um, I've had no no issues developing on any machines that I've used or that people on my team have used um, so uh, here's just uh, for you to see exactly what this looks like in practice so this is webauthn.io you can use it just to show people this or whatever. It's literally just you create, you just register and then you can authenticate with it. Um, so basically, I'm going to create a username. Um, I don't know. We'll say SLC Python. And then we talked about how there's a registration piece and an authentication piece. So right now I'm going to do the registration piece to, to enroll. Um, so it's pretty easy. Uh, I'm just going to register. 
And then now it's asking me to pick an option. And for lack of making this complicated, I'm just gonna choose this device right now and then we can dig into the other options. But if I choose this device, all it's gonna ask me for, because my machine allows this, is a, just a biometric gesture, right? So I'm just gonna to touch and now I'm, I'm enrolled, I'm registered. And then to authenticate, um, I, I'm gonna do the same gesture, the finger, and I'm logged in. So that's how awesome this is from a user experience perspective. And I also wanna point out something else that's a little more subtle but also super cool about this is I practically did nothing and I also did two-factor authentication. Um, so if you think about the possible factors of authentication, I think it's you know something you know, something you are, something you have, right? Is that kind of the, the basics? Um, so by having my computer, it's one thing, and by giving the biometric, that was a second thing. And if I didn't have biometrics on this machine, I could have used a, like a, a machine level password for that. Um, so like when I have this in clamshell mode and I don't have access to that biometric key, um, it just asked me for my, my machine password. Um, every, yeah? How can I trust that? I mean, that's kind of the cool point of this, right? Like, is I want to be able to trust that that legitimately did the right thing. And then you're going to show me in Python, so that's why I'm asking it that way. Yeah. Um, okay. So, so just because I clicked a button doesn't mean I trust it. Like, it just means that I was able to authenticate and register, right? So. How do I verify that what I did was actually not sure of anyone else? Mm -hmm. I can trust it locally on my machine. And then how can I verify that pulling that public key down and, and decrypt it with my private key is actually happening? Yeah. And I don't mean to like dig into the details unless you want to. We, we can, uh, how much time do we have? Yeah, we can do it after. Oh, we have a little bit of time. We can, we can do it after. Yeah, no, we're going to look at some code and maybe that will help clarify yeah, things. And bring out some of the specifics. Um, okay, so um, one more thing that I want to show is uh, basically um, ways that you can use other devices to authenticate via Bluetooth. Right, so um, I don't know if somehow it actually records these things, but we'll do SLC Python 1. Um, and I'm going to hit register, and I get that same prompt. Funny, because I'm on Chrome, they want me to believe that I can only use an Android to do this. Um, but So it's going to give me this, this QR code. And uh, what's that? Somebody else scans it right now. Yeah, <laughs> yeah well, <laughs> you could. You'll just have the keys to log into this. All right, somebody scan it. It should work on an Android or an iPhone. Who wants to? It's just you're going to have this key for SLC Python 1. So this demo doesn't have any any way of adding a second device, like a second laptop or anything? I have to place my phone closer to your computer, sorry. Oh. <laughs> Oh, there was. No, I think it did it. It did it? Yeah. But I don't know what happened now. Ooh, something went wrong. Uh-oh. Probably because I'm not trusted on your computers. <laughs> Could be. We have a... I tested it with oh, my... It timed out. I was oh, like, it timed yeah. out? Yeah, that's what it's up there. Do you want to try again, or should no, I just... I'll do it. Okay, I'll do it. Um... Be fast, because someone's going to challenge you. <laughs> <laughs> All right, here we go. Okay, so I'm scanning and it's just doing a little prompt here. I wish I could share my phone screen, but. Well, I think people behind me can see mine, so that's useful. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so it's saying, do you want to save a passkey for SLC Python 1 on webauthn.io? Um, and then I'm going to say continue. Also, 
interesting point I just noticed here, it said that it was gonna save that pass key in my iCloud keychain. So that's Apple's attempt to, uh, you know, help solve some of those problems about failover with device failings and things like that. Of course, putting it in the cloud makes it a little more vulnerable, but you know, trade-offs. Um, anyway, so that's what this looks like from a, a UI perspective. Um, so I have a very simple um, demo that the people at Ubico put together here just with some code. Um, it's a Flask app, very simple, that, uh, that we can take a look at. Do people want to see just the Python and take my word for it on the JavaScript, or do you want to see the JavaScript too? Yeah. <laughs> I'm old, I have bad eyes. All right, JavaScript, yes or no? Yes. Yeah? Okay. Let me pull that up. <clears throat> Sorry, I didn't stick that in my slides. Um, okay. All right. So, um, all right, so obviously the request to enroll is gonna originate from the browser uh, through this JavaScript. So let's uh, take a look at that first. So they used the fetch API. I just thought this was nice because it uses fetch and flask, super simple stuff. That's easy to follow even if you haven't used them a lot before. Um, okay, so the first thing that's happening here is we're making this API request, um, API register begin. So that register begin, you, you could call it something else if you were implementing the server, but that's kind of standard, that's what people tend to call it. Um, and so we're making this post request to the register begin endpoint. And that's basically gonna tell the server just, hey, I wanna enroll, can you walk me through this? Um, so jumping back to the Python on the Flask server, um, here we have that endpoint, right? And so this is using, um, by the way, the Yubico library for, for implementing this. And I, I mean, you absolutely could try to implement all this if you wanted to, but you're not gonna have the benefit of a bunch of other people looking at it, and it's a ton of decoding and encoding and stuff like that. It's not really that fun. Um, but basically, the server is now gonna create uh, the beginning pieces of data needed to start this process. So we're creating a user entity to identify this user. And um, we're sending over, sorry, I haven't looked at this particular piece of code in a while. Um, the Credentials, where is this coming from? Oh yeah, okay, that's. And then basically we're just gonna pass over some of the server's preferences. So you as the server implementer can specify what level of security you wanna have and what sort of certifications you'd like to get about how the credential that you're gonna get was created. Um, so this, this right here, without going too much into the details, is that it's this server saying, here's, here's the level of security that I will accept. And in this example, it's, it's low because they don't, uh, you know, they're just trying to keep it simple for education's sake. Um, so, uh, final thing is we're taking these options and passing them back over to the client. Uh, <laughs> Sorry, is everyone following up to this point? Yeah. 
There, you, now you should have the... Yeah, I'll give a minute so to take a look. register the returns of state and then options in the state, I, I would assume, is something that says you passed or failed. Yeah, so the, the state is um, basically this protocol, even though it's happening over, or it would seem to be like a, a rest thing, it's not stateless. Um, so that's what the state is, is you're caching the actual protocol state. Thank you. Yeah. Um, it's not important for the details of this conversation. Yeah, pro probably not, not, just depending on the level of detail you guys want. Right. I don't want to lose people. I didn't mean to dig into that, sorry. No, you're good, you're good. Um, okay, so then we're back in JavaScript, right? Um, so we've sent this post request and we, where'd it go? Yeah, there we go. Okay, so we've sent the register begin post request, um, and now we're gonna actually do the work of calling the, the API, um, the browser API. So that is, uh, let's see. So 15, or so where it gets back the request from that create read register, and then does a bunch of stuff with that data, and then submits it to 2021, correct? Yep. So this create, and I'm just a little bit, okay. So they're using a library for this. Um, but anyway, this create is them calling in to the browser to ask to actually create the public-private key pair. So that's kind of the magic moment of creating these keys. Um, and then basically the next step is just taking those credentials that have been created. The private key is now stored on the machine and the public key we now have right here in this response variable and that's going to get passed back over to the, the server. And that's going to hit the register complete endpoint, which is the second, second component of registration. Um, and I'll show you what that looks like. Okay, so um, that's this endpoint here, register complete. And basically, there is a lot of detail to this part, but it's abstracted through this, this library they're using. But this is where a lot of your, uh, what should I say, trust. trust comes in. Right, this is the server's opportunity to check all of the data that it's getting back. Um, so that can go right down to um, certificates of the hardware. And there's different formats, many of which I've been wrestling with this week, um, that you'll get these attestations, or what they're called, back in from the different hardware providers. Um, but anyway, so the register complete is the server's opportunity to make sure that everything they're, they're getting is on the up and up. And if you as the server you know, programmer, or as the server itself, are okay with everything you've gotten, uh, you can store that public key and then use it for, um, for authentication. Um, this, sorry, does yeah. the free server get a different public key? <coughs> like, basically, does the browser generate a different public key every time we go through the registration flow, or is it the same for everyone? Yeah, so um, I think, okay, I'm not 100% sure I understood. Are you asking if it would be different if you registered with Facebook than when, if I registered with Facebook? No, more like um, if I use my, my laptop and first I register at Facebook and I go to Twitter, register there too, will Facebook yeah. and Twitter have the same public key? No. Um, so it's the keys are actually scoped to the domain of the, the service provider that you're authenticating to. Um, so it wouldn't allow that and it wouldn't do that automatically. I imagine you 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 can yeah yep and that's enforced by the browser it's enforced by the i would i guess the server side um so 
it's enforced by the hardware on the client side and it can be enforced by the server side if that makes sense because when I hit that browser API it'll say hey he's trying to log into Facebook with this key and then the hardware will go okay yeah that key is for Facebook that's fine and then same thing on the server um, the server can check that that's scoped properly um, all right uh, do we want to go through authentication? <laughs> I know this is getting a bit uh, detailed and might be better served by you looking at it on your own time. Is anyone really eager to do that? Okay. <laughs> I think we can leave it there. Um, but uh, basically it's a simple you know, REST style API um, for authentication as well. And there are similar browser APIs for, for uh, calling into your hardware. Um, anyway, thanks for bearing with me. Um, yeah. One more quick question. You're showing uh, UBCO. Yep. You know, is like big with the FIDO specs. Are there other companies or vendors that, like you say, would provide the, the plugin library that you could use if you're writing something in class or whatever? Mm -hmm. There are others I'm aware of. The project I'm working on right now, uh, we're basically working on top of this, but in a Django project. Um, so I haven't looked in detail at them, but I'm pretty sure. And of course, there's other language implementations. The Yubico themselves has, has Java and Python. Thank you. Yeah. Um, all right. That's kind of all I had uh, prepared. But, but if anybody has further questions, I'm happy to answer them and happy to answer them after if you want to get in contact with me and of course this is something I'm I'm learning right now so I want to speak to the trust thing one more time yeah it's kind of a thing I've been harping on and I apologize for that in advance but one of the things that I think about when I see that is that means that Ubico has at least they have open source code which is nice that I can read and validate how they're actually doing that um, do you know besides you said you don't really know anybody else besides Ubico that's really doing this Code or is there other people that are doing it that you, that are like not open sourcing it or not providing their source in some way? Because uh, that feels, that's the trust thing that I would think that most people would want to see. I think so. We've actually had this conversation at the the company where I've been working on this, mm -hmm. and it's it's come down to basically what you're talking about, where we want the stuff that we're trusting to do all these check all these attestations and right. um, do the trust bits to be open source. Um, and then it's a matter of kind of at what level could you close source well, things. It's probably at the microcode level. You know, down in the firmware somewhere is probably where you close it. Yeah, so that's, that's probably closed. Um, and then I think you'll see, for example, so, you know, we use Auth0 with Filtra, and they're the ones who are saying it's going to be expensive if we want to enable WebAuth then. And so they're going to use this to provide, you know, a host of kind of platformized solutions. Um, and like their administration layers and all of that stuff will be closed source. I think most of the closed source stuff would be at that level, but the actual um, trust stuff. I think it needs to be open sourced. Sorry, that was a long answer. Yeah. Yeah. And then I'll ask one more question. Uh -huh. I think you kind of alluded to it at the beginning. How does this compare with OAuth in terms of, like OAuth is all behind the scenes, right? So that's not on your computer. That's the big difference, or is there something else? Mm -hmm. um, okay, so <clears throat> I haven't like, implemented OAuth or anything like that, so I don't have a deep understanding. That's okay if you don't know either. Um, yeah, I, I understand that... So are you talking OAuth or like OpenID Connect? Um, all of them, SAML, yeah, like you can kind of go down the list, it doesn't really matter. 
Yeah. All kind of the same. Yeah, those yeah. have an identity provider. Right, and that's what I was wondering. And I don't believe this doesn't. Does. That's this seems to be more like public key cryptography where you've got the certs on either end. Right, and your, and your third party is you, basically. Instead Not necessarily. Of, but it could, that yeah, I guess it could be. Yeah. Group, you know, okay, yeah. Yeah. So to, to draw those apart um, a little bit for everyone. So what was mentioned? What was your name, by the way? I'm Clint. Clint, okay. <laughs> So these protocols that Clint mentioned are uh, federation protocols, mostly, um, where you have an identity provider and a service provider. So someone that's responsible for checking the identity and then the service provider can simply say, um, I trust that if that identity provider says that someone is who they say they are, then they are that person. Super common on campuses, right? There's a whole federation for all of universities. It's why I was able to log in. Um, to the Wi-Fi here with my BYU <laughs> credentials. Um, <laughs> so anyway, so that's kind of what that is. And then this is more about actually the cryptographic piece of, of figuring out if that person is who they say they are. So this is something that an IDP or an identity provider would, uh, would be implementing and not the service provider. Yeah. I'm curious, you mentioned a couple times about hardware. Is it truly hardware, like the TBM, um, that's required, or are you talking about just having an up-to-date operating system at that level? Yeah, so I don't know if there are people implementing this in hardware, or sorry, at the operating system level. Um, I, let me, I guess, rephrase it. If I tried to do this with a 10-year-old laptop... Would it work? Yeah. I haven't tried it, and and I so the because this is like an Apple Silicon computer. Um, I've been using a fairly old computer for my development on this project because certain Docker containers wouldn't run. Blah blah blah. Um, but and that that's from 2019, and it works fine. Um, and I think you could go back one, two, or three more years from there and probably have it work. Uh, before that, probably not. Because I think WebAuthn was like 16, 17, 18, something like that, where they started to work it in. Um, but I don't, don't quote me on that. I, You can, and actually there's a check. I wonder if they have it here. Um, I would guess it's about your browser age. Yeah, typically... Well, yeah. What, or whatever you're using. Yeah, so there is, a, there is a browser API that you can call just to say, hey, is, is WebAuthn an option here? Um, so that's how you would handle that in terms of backwards compatibility, which brings up, you know, we're going to be with passwords for a little bit because of things like that. Um, but, yeah. All right, if nothing else, um, thank you. The offer to sign up for Filtra still stands. Um, if you want to for sure uh, get some of those opportunities sent within the next week, give Shadrach your email so that we can verify that it was actually somebody from this meeting. Um, or, or if you forget to give me your email, we'll just look at the timestamps of the account creation. And I'm worried that we'll see other people, but it's fine. They'll, they'll get lucky. They'll get lucky. Yeah. Just, just stop. But yeah, it'll take three minutes to set up and we'll send you jobs that match your criteria for the rest of your life or, you know, however long you want to do it for. Yeah. All right. Thanks, guys. You go around. All right. Well, we've come to the end of tonight's meetup group, but not of the meetup, hopefully. Uh, yeah. yeah, so that's that's what we're going to have to figure out. But while we're figuring out the numbers, our next meetup will be the 2nd of November. Um, we're still looking for a talk. I've had one person reach out via Slack, but if you want to give a talk, uh, please do. 
uh, reach out via our Slack. If you don't know where our Slack is, uh, it's hidden because Meetup keeps changing their UI. Uh, but you just go here, and then you can click this read more, and then there's a big old link right here, right below our code of conduct on purpose. So uh, yeah, go ahead and join that if you want. We have lots of stuff going on there. Um, and now let's do some basic math. Um, <laughs> Are you in a uh, yeah, I've noticed. Uh, <laughs> I know, right? Uh, okay, so we got to, I believe we got to what, 10? 13. 13? Who's 14? 42. Who's 14? Okay. Who doesn't have a number still? Who doesn't want one? 15, 16, 17. Awesome. How many duplicates do we have there? Do we have any duplicates? We'll find out. We'll find out. If there's a collision, we actually have enough to like... Speaking of what we got. <clears throat> so we got to 17. No, random dot choice. Duh. Uh, okay, well, this one ran out of battery. Well, no, it didn't. Or, yes, it did. Did it? I think, yeah, this was the one on the table. We're going to be giving out this guy. This is a... Uh, this is the latest... In, uh, this is the monster mask, which is basically a Halloween on steroids. This is a Halloween, the special orange edition that we're also giving out tonight. And the classic M0 Halloween. Now all of these are from a company called Adafruit. Um, and we are putting together, I'm putting together a curriculum using these for a teacher in East High, uh, hopefully for January, but we'll see. But yeah. Oh, this is my last little reminder. If you haven't had a chance to make your optional $5 donation, uh, now's a great chance to, to feel guilty about winning a raffle prize. No, I'm just kidding. But <laughs> um, yeah, let's do, let's, let's give away a few of these. Let me keep the pie portals for later. Pie badge, pie badge, pie badge, lots of pie badges. <clears throat> pie badge, Halloween. Yeah, let's give away all the Halloweens. Let's see, one, two, three, four giveaways tonight. So, first winner. Well, let's do some coding. And, um, and oh, yeah, yeah. Boom. Does that look good? PR review? Rejected. No. Yeah, merge? Okay. Three, two, one, boom. Number four. Yay! Uh, go ahead and come up and, and select which one of these you want, and then you get to hit enter as you do so. And, uh, yeah. I think I'm going for the orange edition. Yes, orange edition. And we're ready to go. Enter. Number eight. Yay, no one. <laughs> That's fine. That's more chances for everybody else. Fourteen. Oh, look, you just won. Ah, no, you gotta pick somebody else. Oh, it's your gear at the meetup. Okay. You just edit code.py on one of these and. You can uh, make a Bitcoin miner, not really, but. Okay. It'd be really slow, I think. And then go ahead and hit enter. Number 11. Hey, that's me. Woohoo! Thanks. Doo, 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 doo. And number five isn't here. <laughs> <laughs> oh. I think half people didn't write numbers down. I don't think we had 16. 15. Oh, there you go. Yay! Okay, well, once again, I'll be seeing y'all in November. Uh, pizza will be served again. Oh, that's the other thing. Help me take that pizza home. I can't take all that pizza home. I will become way too filled with pizza. Uh, yeah, I might grab a few slices, but especially if you're a student, 
please, you have full first uh, first dibs. And yeah, I'm gonna start cleaning up. Please don't leave any food here or laptops here. That happened last time. Uh, somebody yeah. left their whole laptop here, and you that. Free laptop? Uh, yeah, almost. No, it was. I got a free trip to be a super nice guy and drive to somewhere in the valley to drop off a laptop for somebody. So, uh, but please just check your stuff. Make sure your, all your things are there. Because once I close those doors, I can't really reopen them. Because can I? No, wait. No, maybe I can. And I, I'll just ask. You know, with the pizza boxes and stuff, don't leave it out just in front here. Uh, it, where the, where should we stuff the boxes? Because there's a dumpster like up right the around hill. the corner, I think. Yeah. Up the hill, okay. Yeah, so if you just walk up to the other side of the building. The big problem is the president's buildings right there. All yeah. the executives walk by that in the morning. Uh, no one takes up the, the waste between that time. So. See, th those folks have a tendency to nitpick like things that don't matter. So just make sure that they can stay focused. They have the money, so that's I know, and they and keep applying it to broken windows. <laughs> Anyway, well, good to see everybody in good health as well, and yeah, I'll see you in November. Happy Halloween. Thank you, Paris. See you. Thank you. Happy Thanks, Paris. Wow. Hey, Lisa. Sorry, I didn't mean to like harass you, but it's like, you did a really good job. Thank you. Yeah, I just wanted to apologize. No.